Hello, this is your host of uh, Polytox, Eric Kopian, and we're honored to have as our guest today Armand Ghazarian, who is head of Armenia's Migration Service. Mr. Ghazarian is an expert in the field of migration. In fact, he earned his PhD in migration studies. He's a formal journalist and a lecturer at AUA. Mr. Ghazarian, it's a pleasure to have you on our show. My pleasure to be here. Uh, there has been much speculation since uh, the revolution last year that uh, the number of people leaving the country has lessened than the past 10 years. Is there anything uh, factually indicating that or is that more conjecture? Uh, again, thank you for having me. Um, regarding your question, I should say that there are facts and there is statistics showing that the level of emigration has lessened mm -hmm. and uh, we can derive it from two type of statistics. First of all, it's the ratio between the entries and exits uh, from the country. Uh, the statistics, um, the country has been drawing the statistics since uh, early 2000s. And uh, the only three years that we have seen positive di dynamics in terms of entries and exits, meaning that there were more entries than exits, were from 2004 to 2006. And then, uh, once again, in 2018. So the difference uh, was uh, 15,313. Uh, and if we compare it uh, with the same figure of 2017, um, it is significant because the, uh, the number was minus uh, around 26,000 in uh, 2017. But what's more significant in that is that the uh, number of the people holding Armenian passports, uh, this ratio for them, uh, has uh, decreased significantly. Uh, in 2017, we had minus uh, 36,000, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, around there. And uh, in 2018, the number was minus 4,500. So this uh, has been a significant uh, change uh, in our migration dynamics. But I'd like to underscore one thing there. Uh, this is a short-term dynamic. Uh, and we need to improve significantly. We need to uh, conduct systemic reforms for this dynamic to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad you have uh, <clears throat> numbers that are factual and based on accurate, uh, on accurate statistics. Because as we know, the migration issue, not just in the, for the current government, but uh, for the previous government, has been uh, what, what, they, what they say in American English, a political football, uh, where it's, everybody uses it for their own purpose. <clears throat> However, I have always questioned the accuracy of these numbers uh, because I don't know how you can accurately count someone leaving the country uh, for good with the mass numbers of people that uh, go to work in Russia or different places for six months, nine months, and they come back. Uh, how accurate, uh, I mean, we all have the anecdotal, you know, your, your, your neighbor's son leaves, you know, you have those kinds of, uh, you know, we, we've all known there's been immigration out of Armenia for the last 20, 30 years, in fact, further. Uh, how do you, uh, how do you get accurate information based on the fact that so much of the immigration is actually labor migration that's temporary? And, and, and this is also something, by the way, which a lot of people don't know, that labor migration was going on in Soviet times. This is nothing new. People in Soviet times were going to work in different parts of the Soviet Union. So how accurate are these numbers that people throw around or have been thrown around for the past 20 years? So let me start a bit from afar. Uh, the same is true not only for Armenia, but for the rest of the world as well. Migration um, is a sphere where people uh, play with the numbers uh, very often. And uh, this goes on in Europe, in the United States, in other parts of the world as well. Uh, what we do in Armenia and why I referred to the statistics I did. Uh, there are other uh, statistical evidences uh, as well, but I prefer to use this ratio of entries and exits because it is probably the most accurate that we currently have. It, is, uh, it has two characteristics that makes it accurate. First of all, it is mechanical counting. So someone enters, 
you register him. Someone exits, you register him. Uh, and this may go on many times, right? So this is mechanical action. Secondly, uh, any statistics uh, that is being drawn, uh, it gets more accurate with the time. And we have had this type of statistics for already almost 20 years, so it makes it a lot more accurate. Uh, concerning the labor migration and how we count the effects, that's why I usually do not use this figure for trimesters or for semesters. Usually I try to use it on a yearly basis because on your yearly ratio, the, the entry, uh, the exits of the labor migration that usually takes place uh, in spring, then counts down in autumn or late in winter when uh, the labor migrants usually uh, come back home for their winter holidays. And there is another thing. Uh, we know that there is this uh, tourist flow uh, out of the country for winter holidays, right? But for the next year, you register it as an entry, okay? So this, uh, if you take it on a yearly basis, this uh, creates a balance, a yes. So that's why we are using specifically that uh, figure. Yeah, I mean, I know you're not, uh, you're not an economist, but what is the, as far as labor migration and the remittances that come back? First of all, what is the net impact of that on the economy? Do we have statistical figures that are accurate? And secondly, uh, given the fact that we've had over the last three years, actually through both regimes, uh, significant economic growth, uh, has the level of the importance of remittance money, has it been increasing, has it been decreasing, and what is the level of it? Let me start from the, your last question. Uh, the trend is that the importance of the remittances uh, is going down. Uh, and uh, this trend has started uh, since uh, the economic situation in Russia has worsened. So uh, earlier in mid-2000s uh, and later in uh, early 2010s, uh, the bank transfers, the uh, individual bank transfers, were around 20% of Armenia's GDP coming from remittances. Currently, Central Bank estimates it around 14 to 15% of the GDP. So we see that there is a steady decline of importance of remittances. And secondly, these remittances are mainly directed towards consumption and uh, not towards sustainable uh, economic uh, you know, development or investments. So usually this comes and disappears in the uh, consumption. Okay. Uh, this, uh, and pardon me, uh, if I may uh, add there, uh, we are now trying to devise uh, programs that would l um, direct these transfers to m towards more uh, sustainable economic uh, development, and we have been working with our European colleagues on this as well. Well, that's interesting. We might go back to that. Sure. If we have time. Uh, a lot of people who are not in Armenia don't notice, but. We, we obviously, we've had a migration issue for the last 30 years, but now over the last year, year and a half, we actually have an immigration issue uh, where there are significant numbers of people coming in from different countries, uh, India, Iran, other places, Arab countries, uh, to work here. Uh, and you can go to a construction site where you see the laborers are all from India. I've seen that myself. Uh, car washes. <clears throat> which raises the, I mean, this is much, much more an economic question, is everyone knows that this is a country that statistically has 15, 20% unemployment, depending on how you count it. How is it even feasible for people to come from another country and find work here and do these kinds of jobs? Are they doing the kind of jobs that Armenian citizens are not willing to do? Or are they undercutting uh, jobs that Armenian citizens could have? I mean, this is an issue all over Europe. But it's a very interesting phenomenon, and I'm sure you've studied it uh, in a scientific manner. So can you talk sure. about that? So we need to differentiate two types of things here. Um, Armenia has been traditionally the country of emigration, and our migration strategies, our migration policies have only, uh, always been devised uh, and designed uh, in a way that uh, they were trying to address emigration issues. And 
immigration in Armenia has always been in the form of refugees, refugee inflows. Uh, Armenian nationals, refugees from Azerbaijan in the first years of independence, uh, later a smaller uh, flow of uh, refugees from Iraq after Iraq war, and then obvi obviously Syria. this inflow from Syria, exactly. Um, and this past uh, year has seen the increase of Indian immigration uh, towards the country. Uh, we have always had traditionally this inflow of Indian students who are mainly coming to study uh, medicine uh, because, you know, India has traditionally has the shortage of doctors because it's a huge country and with big public health issues. So uh, they are trying to send uh, medical students all over the world uh, to later come back and improve the medical situation uh, back in India. Uh, but in 2017, uh, the Armenian government has taken two decisions, uh, easing and facilitating the issuance of visas uh, for Indian nationals. Uh, if I can interrupt you, this, yeah. this also happened last week with China. Yes. In which you know, this is the same thing can happen with China, even though it's a different country on a different level. Um, of I don't think the same thing would happen with China um, with two reasons. Currently, the Chinese nationals have the same regulations as Indians do, but we do not see the same level of inflow of Chinese uh, people and Chinese workers here. Uh, and there are two reasons for this. Uh, first, it's uh, the organization of the state, the difference between organization of the state in China and uh, in India. China is a more structured and more organized uh, in this sense uh, and uh, their population outflows and inflows are more regulated, much more controlled, right, mo much more controlled rather than uh, in India and secondly China has managed to alleviate the numbers of people uh, from poverty uh, recently in significant significant way, uh, which we do not uh, see in the case uh, of India. And uh, what happened with uh, the migration situation in India is that in 2017, first we facilitated uh, the visa regime for the Indian nationals who had the residence permits in the Gulf countries. Secondly, uh, at the end of 2017, the government has facilitated also the issuance of visa for the Indian nationals from India itself. And we saw in 2018 this inflow of labor migrants from uh, India. This creates problems, but this also creates opportunities. We should not view it only in negative terms or only in positive terms. We should balance it. First of all, it showed the problems inside our migration regulation. Uh, we saw that we do not have a sustainable uh, labor permit system for uh, foreigners. And secondly, uh, we saw that overall our migration in word migration regulations are not sustainable. So currently we are reviewing it comprehensively and we will establish, uh, we will reform what can be reformed or and we will establish uh, new regulations uh, for the future. Well, you touched on uh, <coughs> reforming uh, migration, uh, immigration laws, uh, for all kinds of people. There's been a lot of talk by every Armenian government, and especially this one, the Prime Minister calling on Armenians from abroad to move to our highest uh, However, uh, some of the laws, regulations even dealing with our, uh, people of Armenian nationality coming from abroad are, are absurd, where you have to, someone with a clearly Armenian last name who speaks Armenian has to prove that they're Armenian by using church records that they might have and might not have. A lot is said about promoting it, but uh, and there has been cases of people bringing in their prop, their personal effects that are stuck because of taxes and things at the border. Uh, if the government is interested in actually promoting uh, Armenians to return to Armenia, uh, what is it structurally doing to reform these absurd uh, glitches in the law? 
Well, it is trying to reform it, okay. obviously. And uh, the thing is that we are trying to create a system which would promote the return of the Armenian nationals, meaning those who hold Armenian passports. And secondly, we are working on repatriation. This is not fully my domain, of course. Repatriation is more uh, um, the domain of diaspora policy. Um, but. Uh, I would say that uh, the work is being done in the government at this very moment. Uh, meanwhile, these systems should be designed in a way uh, for people not to abuse them. This is also very important because uh, we have also the presumption that the systems might be abused and this also needs to be taken into abused account. Abused by who? By abused. people who are not Armenian? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Have we had cases of that? Or is yes, we have. yes, we have had cases of that. Can you give examples of like what, I mean, what, what is the case that someone claims to be Armenian? Is it for political asylum or is it for... No, the, the asylum system is a bit uh, different. The asylum system is more regulated and we have um, rather clear laws uh, on asylum. It is more structurally uh, designed. Uh, but the thing is that... Um, I wouldn't like to go much into details, but okay. I would say that there might be cases of abuse, so uh, we need to take that into account as well. Okay. Uh, you've obviously, I don't know if you've studied the profile of the, uh, the, the diaspora Armenian that returns to Armenia, uh, or even the, uh, the Armenian citizens that return to Armenia. Uh, is there a particular profile of a person? Do they tend to be uh, people who are affluent or they tend to be people who are couldn't uh, they're down on their luck they couldn't work in Russia who is if you're gonna what's the median average person who's a diaspora who moves to Armenia do they tend to be better educated Do they tend to be more poorly educated or is there a profile or is it too diverse to put an average profile on it if we are speaking about diaspora, I would say it is too diverse. We cannot have one single profile of a diasporan person returning to Armenia. But in case of uh, the Armenian nationals, we can draw an average profile of that depending on the area from which they return. So from Europe, uh, we have two types of inflows of the Armenian nationals. First is uh, the forced return that we are witnessing now and uh, that uh, increased uh, last two years because Armenia had signed readmission uh, re uh, agreement with the European Union, uh, meaning that the Armenian nationals residing uh, in the European Union uh, illegally should be returned to Armenia. And the same applies to the European citizens residing illegally in Armenia as well, but we haven't had much cases of that. Uh, so this forced return is one type. Uh, the second uh, type is the voluntary return or something that uh, we uh, call um, this medium between the forced and voluntary return. So these people are warned, if you do not go back, you will be returned forcefully. So uh, usually those people uh, try to return. This is middle class. Usually they go to the European Union because of two reasons. First because of economic opportunities, and secondly, to improve their, um, let's say, standard of life. Um, if we say that the first years of Armenian independence had seen this emigration for survival, mm -hmm. lately, this emigration trend to the European Union mainly uh, has been the emigration to improve the quality of life. People wanting better welfare system, wanting better healthcare system, better education. So what is our job here? Our job is to create this uh, basis for circular migration. People want to get education in good European universities. They should have the opportunity to do it legally. Uh, pursue their education goals there and return to Armenia to contribute later. So this, uh, this is the rather middle class uh, already on the verge of improving the standard of living. So if we work on improving healthcare and welfare systems in this country, uh, this flow that was illegal uh, might turn more into a legal circular migration.
And pardon me, this has also been uh, stipulated uh, in the Global Compact on Migration, which Armenia has joined as well, and which was adopted uh, last December in Marrakesh. One of the things that uh, there's been a lot of talk in, among, in the tech industry, given the constant, consistent shortage of programmers, which is, I think, is like they're short two, three thousand dollars, two, three thousand people a year, and those numbers just keep exponentially going as the industry grows. There's been a lot of calls about liberalizing, bringing in uh, foreign programmers from surrounding countries or India or Iran or other places. Uh, do you think that's the right approach in dealing with that, or is, would you recommend something else? And has there have you has there been pressure on the government from the tech sector to liberalize uh, bringing in foreign nationals to work as engineers and programmers in the industry where there's actual need for it? So if we, obviously from the tech sector, the view might be different, but from the migration perspective, I would say that this also is connected with the labor permit system in the country, how we allow foreigners to work in, in our country. And as I have said before, the system that we had previously was a bad system. Uh, first, it was introduced in 2016, and the system basically collapsed in two months. So the government had to uh, seize uh, the work of that system, and currently we're working on improving it. But uh, the idea that the highly qualified and highly educated professionals should have more facilitated uh, access to work in this country is there. And I think uh, we will move in that direction. And who facilitates that? The company that wants to hire you? Or how, how is that facilitated? The overall policy uh, should be facilitated by the government, meaning that the government might uh, just say that the um, highly qualified uh, professionals should be exempted from taking labor permits, let's say. This might be one case. One thing that I want to, and this is entirely speculative, is because uh, this sort of requires forward planning. Uh, there's a lot of countries in uh, South and Central America, a place like Mexico and uh, Costa Rica, that actually recruit uh, American seniors uh, to go live there. Uh, uh, first of all, because they pump money into the economy. Uh, and second of all, it works for the seniors because they have a much higher standard of living on their pensions than they normally would uh, in, uh, in the United States or other advanced countries that they're living in. Uh, we have a unique opportunity in this country because we have a lot of Armenian nationals who live in affluent countries, whether it's Germany, Canada, United States, and who are going to have very uh, subpar uh, retirements if they stay in their countries. Uh, obviously, facilitating these people requires certain things. One thing, for example, that uh, South Central American countries do is they work with um, the American medical system. So you can take like your medical insurance with you and things of that nature. I know you're a new government, but have you thought about in these ways of uh, using the system to develop the country and by bringing people who have a one on, on for their for their purposes have a higher standard of living? while the income that they have, which is their pensions, which are much higher than local pensions, will actually contribute to the economy? Uh, okay, to be honest, this uh, is not directly concerning my mandate, but uh, I know uh, that there has, have been discussions on this matter in the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs and in, in the Ministry of Healthcare, if I'm not mistaken. So they might give you a better answer. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I want to finish up with what you suggested, which was uh, programs that you're having about turning remittances into investments, because I want to give you a chance to explain that before we wrap up. Can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for the opportunity of explaining that further. Uh, so uh, our idea is basically that labor migration is something seasonal in case of Armenia. Our labor migrants usually go to the countries of the Eurasian Union in spring and return in winter, as I said. But the members of their families stay. And if we try to cooperate with the members of their families who stay here to establish businesses, to use the remittances that they receive from their 
relatives labor migrants to invest in more sustainable economic activity, this might create a pool factor that might return the labor migrant uh, himself or herself. And uh, this has been tried in many countries. You referred to Mexico. Mexico is uh, one example. Uh, other Eastern Partnership countries as well, for example, Moldova. And we are trying to design now, we are actually in the process of designing now a specific program with our European colleagues uh, on this matter, and hopefully it will be successful. How does the mechanics work? Does it like, uh, if I'm sending back $200 a month, mm -hmm. uh, do you take a certain portion of that and you put it and you match it with other dollars? I mean, how does that work? How does that? Uh, let structure? me bring the uh, example of Moldova. They uh, did it on equal partnership basis, and I think this is a good uh, approach. For example, uh, the labor migrants says that I'm ready to invest in this business, let's say $5,000. And the fund or the government will invest the same amount of money uh, into that business. Is that a grant or a loan? It's a grant. Okay. It's a grant. It's given once and yeah. for all. Yeah. Okay. But then uh, we should check also the sustainability of that business. You, the failure in Moldova was around 10%, if I'm not mistaken. 10% failure is okay for this type of yeah. uh, businesses. So we're trying to take the best of them, but also to accommodate it to our local realities. Okay, well, Mr. Ghazarian, it was a pleasure having you on our show, and uh, thank you for all the work you do. Thank you.